How can I follow up on that? How can I follow up on that singing? I can't even try. Oh uh, gosh, you're all so young. Most of you are so young looking. It's strange to be at a conference where I'm one of the older people. Yesterday, uh, the floor was given over specifically to young polyglots because they're young. I hope this isn't given to me just because I'm old now, but that's kind of what I want to talk about today. As this title of mine is uh, Reading Literature in Foreign Languages. Reading in our day is in a crisis. And uh, if there are a lot of advantages to being young, there are some advantages to being old too. You have perspective and experience. Our world is changing very, very rapidly. There's all sorts of new innovations all the time. And when things change, one of three things can happen. They can simply change. They can just become different, neither better nor worse. Often, things do become better. Things get better. There are new things, there are innovations that are better than old ones, and that's a good thing. But I think we're all conditioned to be optimistic and imagine that's always the case. And it isn't. Sometimes, older things are better. The way it was before was better, and we're losing certain things that we had before, and we're not getting something better in terms of benefit. So that's what my topic today is really about. The fact that, I hope this works, in our age, reading is going away. Reading is becoming a lost art, okay? Uh, if I just sound like an old man bemoaning that, I can give you some <laughs> citations. Here's a report. Is anybody familiar with this? Reading at Risk by the National Endowment for the Arts, about 10, 12 years ago now. This is a damning and devastating report that just proves with lots and lots of evidence that across the board, people read less than they used to do. They, read, they don't read as well as they used to do. They don't read the quality that used to do. Reading scores, reading knowledge, everything is going down across the board. So we can supplement that with our own experience. This is an American report. Perhaps that's just in the American context, but unfortunately what happens in America is kind of trend-setting, and it happens around the world later on. I lived in Berlin 20 years ago, and I hadn't been back until this past summer. And what I wanted to do more than anything else when I went back was go to all the wonderful used bookstores that there used to be on every street in Berlin. And now, there just aren't as many. They've been swallowed up. They're going away. It's a simple fact that newspapers are folding, <laughs> publishing is more exclusive. There just is not the reading culture in modern society, contemporary society, that there used to be. That's a fact. That's a fact, but how can you react to that? Some people say, well, so what? Okay? Of course people used to read more because reading used to have a monopoly. Reading used to be the only way you could get information, the only way you could get facts, the only way you could be entertained. And we're now in a culture of what people in research call multiliteracies. There are other ways. There are blogs. There's all sorts of stuff on the internet. There's videos. There's all sorts of other ways that we can get our information. So naturally, if the monopoly is broken, you're not going to spend as much time doing that. So I can answer this, so what, as a question with, so what, with an exclamation point. And that's the whole point of this talk, is that these other things are not a substitute for reading. Old-fashioned reading is a very unique tool, a special tool for learning languages, for language development, that I'll talk about in the course of this talk. Uh, some people are still unconvinced with that. They want to ask another, so what, with a question mark. And they say, you know, we can provide some other research that says you're being an alarmist. Actually, with all the texting that young people do, all the time that young people spend on Facebook and stuff like that, they might actually amass more hours looking at a text than back when they read books. But the answer to that is that this sort of flitting around, looking a bit over here, looking a bit over there, it doesn't add up to the same thing. Not all reading is of the same value when it comes to language development. That's the point I want to make. So what I'm going to be talking about is that reading first and foremost as a tool as reading for overall language development. The basis in applied linguistics for this is not mysterious, it's not uh, unknown, these are famous people. We have Stephen Krashen, for instance, who's always talked about the importance of extended pleasure reading so that you can acquire a language rather than needing to labor at learning it. And more specifically, as Mr. Iverson led us in yesterday and we heard some other talk, based on the studies of Paul Nation, a linguist at, uh, from New Zealand, 
who talks a lot about vocabulary size and extensive reading, both of which I'm going to talk about a lot today. So here's his website. If you're interested in the kind of thing I'm talking about and you haven't had to have heard about him, he has all sorts of free material, not only his own research, but tools for measuring your vocabulary size, word vocabulary lists that you can use to make word lists if you like the idea of doing that, uh, extensive readers, and all sorts of things. So I put his website there for you. Uh, am I speaking too fast for the translators? Or is it good? Good? <coughs> so picking right up on that, let's talk about why reading is necessary, above all, for vocabulary. Vocabulary size and measurement. I'm very happy that I happen to be placed after uh, Mr. Iverson because he saved me a lot of time. Uh, I don't need to cover the same things, but I can just highlight a lot of the things that he said. For vocabulary size, what we're really looking at learning is the concept of a word family. Now, he spoke yesterday about words, about lemmas, about other kinds of things. A word family, just to be sure, let's take uh, a verb, to accept. Then I have I accept, she accepts, he accepted, we are accepting. Those are three verbal forms. So those are four different forms as a verb. We have uh, a noun, acceptance. We have adverbs and adjectives, acceptable, unacceptable, unacceptably. If you know the basic root of accept, you should be able to know all of these. So when we say, when you know a word, we talk about knowing a word family. So that's the accept word family. In this kind of research, vocabulary research, these word families are broken down, for convenience's sake, into groups of 1,000. And each thousand is kind of classified as being highest frequency, lowest frequency, lower frequency. So uh, we have these groups of frequency. There's artificial breakings of 1,000, but uh, for convenience's sake, and learning these word families of 1,000 groups. Does anybody know? How many word families an educated native speaker generally knows? Huh? Yes, 20,000. Educated native speakers know at least 20,000. Does anybody know how many words you need to know to begin to survive? Word families need to know to begin to survive? 3,000, yes, somebody said that there. 3,000 is survival level, okay? 3,000 is presuming that that 3,000 is the 500 real core words, and then the next 2,000, 2,500 well-chosen, uh, highest frequency words. If you have those 3,000, again, that's functional survival level. Throw me into a monolingual community, they might not respect me, but they'll know my needs, I'll get what I want, okay? But I need to develop a lot more than that before I get, if I ever get, to 20,000. How much do you need to kind of really engage in a more sophisticated conversation? 5,000. 5,000 to 6,000 word families is what you need to start engaging in a full-scale, meaningful conversation, to be a conversational partner about an intelligent adult topic. How many words do you think you need to know to, say, read a newspaper or watch a movie? That's a little bit more, 7,000 to 8,000 word families. And how many word families do you need to know to read a novel? Starts at 9,000, okay? And that's a relatively easy novel. That's a relatively easy and short novel if we're going to talk about taking a a uh, hard novel, a longer novel, a more artistic and literary novel, it might be 12,000, it might be 15,000. You need a lot more words to read a book than you do to engage a conversation. So, a little bit about vocabulary research. How can you know how many words you know? How many word families you know? Well, since this all comes from Paul Nation's uh, University of Victoria Wellington, you can go to their website, and they have a tool there for measuring your vocabulary size. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour. It's uh, interesting to look at the way they estimate it based on various tests. It's a good, interesting tool to take and figure out uh, whether you're a native speaker or a non-native speaker about how many word families you know. 
Unfortunately, yes, it's all in English, and so that's what uh, Alex Rawlings was talking about. English is a privileged language. Everything on Paul Nation's site, in terms of uh, readers and stuff like this, the theory behind it is it's supposed to transfer to other languages as well, but the materials that are available are for measuring your word families in English. Uh, I've been, I was at, I'm now at uh, the American University in the Emirates. Before that, I was in Singapore. And Paul Nation is uh, an affiliate of the institute I was there. So I got to know him personally and work with him. And we did some studies there together looking at this. In particular, I've been working for the past about four years giving this test to my own students. I've had two very, very different groups of students. In Singapore, at the Southeast Asian Ministries of Education's Organization Regional Language Center, my students, <laughs> were adult TEFL professionals. That's to say, they were English language teachers, teacher trainers, supervisors, principals of English language institutes. They were from Thailand, Vietnam, China. They were 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 years old. They'd been studying and teaching and using English their whole lives. At the American University in the Emirates, my students are mostly, not exclusively, but almost uh, mostly native Arab speakers. They're college students. Some are a little bit older, in their 20s maybe, but most of them are in their late teens, early 20s. So these are two very disparate groups. They're different groups of people for study, but they have some commonalities. First commonality is to get into these institutes, to get into the university, every single one of them to whom I've given this test has had to demonstrate that they have a basic B1 level command of English so that they can be studying in an English language institute. That means they've taken the TOEFL exam and gotten 500, or they've taken the IELTS exam and gotten five. So what do you think, when I give them this vocabulary size test, both of these groups, different though they are, have the same average vocabulary size? Anybody care to venture what you think it might be? How many word families? Do these people know, on average? I gave you 500 for TOEFL. It's five for IELTS. Let's stay with a five, a nice round five. 5,000, OK? The average person, I would say, based on this, two groups, I can't generalize for all of humanity, but people, whether they're young Arab speakers uh, in college, in an English-speaking college, whether they're Southeast Asian professionals, they have about 5,000. Do you remember my previous slide? What is 5,000 word families good for? Beginning conversational level. It's entry level for conversation, and yet these people are expecting to carry on studies, sometimes graduate studies. So naturally, this is going to be a struggle for them. This is going to be a bit hard. When I give them this vocabulary size test, we also do a little bit of an interview. And another commonality that these people have is they identify themselves as non-readers. No, they don't read books. Books are boring. Why would anybody read books? Okay? So they say they're non-readers. And yet, if this is the average size, there are people who are beyond the average. Here's another interesting fact. Those who say they are book readers, guess what? Their vocabulary size is generally 8,000 or 9,000. And guess what also? They're generally the better students. They're generally the more successful ones in the program. So there's a very clear relationship between reading, vocabulary size, and overall language learning and academic success. So yesterday, we heard at least two times about the differences between intensive and extensive reading. So once again, I'm grateful that I don't have to spend so much time on this one because I'm going on to the other one. Just to be sure, uh, everybody's positive, we know what it is. Intensive reading means basically when you're going in and you're taking a text and you say, I want the information from it. I want facts. I want information. Okay? Intensive reading is basically, how'd that happen? It's hard. It doesn't, it's not designed to be hard, but the fact is you go in and it's too hard for your level. There are a lot of words that you don't know. And what are you supposed to do with those words? You are supposed to use a dictionary to look them up. That's the definition of intensive reading. And intensive reading can be done with very short text, very texts that aren't related to each other. You can take one from here, one from there, put them together. So we heard yesterday uh, from some of the young polyglots, from Mr. Iverson, uh, that you know, this, there are ways of doing this. I myself 
have done intensive reading. This way, when you're in college, when you're studying a language there, that's sort of the way that's just thrown at you. You take a year or two of conversational language, and then you go into the literature class, and that's what you do. You take the book and a dictionary, and you look up all the words. I have some good memories of that. It's a nice discipline in doing that, but I don't do that anymore. So there's different strokes for different folks. If you like working with word lists, if you like working with uh, flashcards, if you like working with vocabulary, this is a positive thing to do. But if you don't like it, you don't need to do it. So that's why I put here with a question mark. Okay? This is, to me, this is optional. I avoid doing this. I do it with a cookbook if I want to cook something and I need to find out the recipe. But if I'm trying to read something, okay, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go straight to extensive reading. Again, extensive reading is the opposite of what we just saw. Extensive reading is not for facts and information. It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be for pleasure. It's supposed to be for enjoyment. It's supposed to be for entertainment. Okay? Extensive reading is supposed to be relatively easy. A little bit of a challenge, yes, but uh, relatively easy. That means, okay, you are not allowed to use a dictionary. You're not supposed to use a dictionary. So how are you supposed to learn the words that you don't know? You're supposed to get them from context. In order to get them from context, you need to see them a lot which means extensive reading, by definition, has to be of long and connected texts. Not short, choppy texts, not other things. You need to read long, continuous texts. And how good is extensive reading? Extensive reading as a tool, that's the first part of my talk, is not just for reading. It's not just for, uh, for developing vocabulary. It's for overall language development. And there's a formula that some people have developed. If you engage in three hours of extensive reading per week, you will make, in nine months' time, you'll make 12 months' progress across the board in all of your language learning skills and all of your language development. So I think most of us here are word people. Anybody here a number enough person to figure it out? I was really scratching my brain. I can't figure out if this is 20% or 25% increase. Is this 20% faster or 25% faster? This means in four years' time, you'll make five years' progress, okay? So if you'd like to see more about that, here's another name that you can read about, extensive reading, okay? Uh, Rod Waring is a professor in Japan, and he also, on his site, has lots of information about why extensive reading is such a valuable and important uh, technique and task to use. So <clears throat> what Mr. Iverson spoke about yesterday and picking up here. Do you remember? This is a quiz. You need to have a certain percentage of vocabulary already to engage in extensive reading. What percentage was that? You were told yesterday. What was it? <laughs> Neil G. Iverson, what is it? It could be 95, but it's better 98. It's 98 percent. I listened quietly as you said that. I used to disagree like you do, okay, but I've done my own research and I back up what they're saying about nation. It's 98%. You need to know 98% of the words in a text in order to engage in extensive reading, okay? That means out of every 50 words, there should only be one word that you don't know. Your average typical book has about 300 words on a page. That means there can be six words that you don't know on a page. What happens? Why does he say 95? Why is my inclination to say 95? Why does it seem like that's too much? Why does it seem like we don't really need to know that many? It's because already, when we know about 80%, you can get the gist of a text. You can look at it and you can say, I know that this is a romance. I know that somebody's angry here. I know that they're talking about history. I know that this is a war story. Uh, you can get the gist of a text when you only know 80%. So it would seem logical that when you're in the 90s, I mean, come on, if 98% is enough, what happens when you're at 97? Well, what happens when you're at 97 or 95 or 93 or 91 is compared to 80, when you know that you're just getting the gist, you think that you're getting the whole thing, but you're really still basically just getting the gist, okay? This is fine for reading one page. Of course, if you have 97, 95% understanding of the words, you can look at one page and thoroughly understand it. But extensive reading is not about reading one page. It's about reading hundreds of pages. 
And so what will happen if you have less than 98%, slowly but surely, there's a connecting thread that ties together the story, ties together the development of the ideas, ties together the action. And slowly but surely, you will lose that. You won't really understand what happened on that page, and then you go to the next page, and that's a little bit unclear. And you don't even know that it's unclear. So what you tend to do is you say, I don't like this story. This is boring. Okay? I don't like the style of this author. I started it. It seemed good. Okay? But the fact of the matter is that you don't understand enough. Your vocabulary is not high enough for you to read that text. Okay? So you slowly use the connecting thread, and you say, okay, you think that you understand, but you don't. Okay? So that's what's going to happen, and that's why you need to know this much. So to get this text for extensive reading, this is sort of my title here, I'm going to start out with two definitions of literature in my talk today. The first one is very generous. The first definition of literature is basically anything long. Okay? A lengthy text of any nature, any quality. Okay? It can be anything you want as long as it has hundreds of pages. Sure, you can do it with 90 pages. If you want, you can use a thousand page book. Okay? But basically you want to read a couple of hundred pages by a given author at a given time to engage in profitable, extensive reading. It has to have the same author because the same author has continuity of vocabulary and continuity of style and continuity of story and argument so you can focus on the development of it. Only if you're following something by the same author is that person, every person has his or her own favorite vocabulary. To grow outside of that range of everyday conversation towards reading knowledge, you need to meet the same vocabulary over and over again, which is what you do in a long text by the same author. Let's go back to that, comparing conversational and reading vocabularies. 9,000 minus 5,000 equals 4,000. There's a 4,000 word family difference between conversational vocabulary and reading vocabulary. But these 4,000 words, if you go and you look at the classification of the word families that they fall into, they're not rare words. They're not strange words. They're not uncommon words. These are words, again, every educated native speaker knows 20,000 words. These are only, they're under the 10,000 range. These are words that everybody knows and everybody uses. Not every day, okay? But if you don't know these words, you're going to have some problems. They are met in conversation. And you do need them if you are going to express yourself in an accurate, detailed, sophisticated fashion. If you're going to say exactly what you mean. So why is it that you don't, you can start with conversation at 5,000? With all due respect for all of us who've struggled to get to conversation, as Alex Rowling said, it's possible to try to learn a language just to develop reading knowledge. If you isolate a skill and you say, I'm only going to learn this language to read it, then reading it can be kind of easy. But if you're after holistic, overall <laughs> command of a language, then conversation is simply easier than reading. You need to know fewer words, and conversation is face-to-face. -face. Conversation gives that kind of context and repairs. When you're conversing with somebody, if you're conversing with me and you're trying to acquire my vocabulary, okay, so I know more than you, when you don't understand me, you can say, I don't understand you. Even if you don't say it with words, your facial expression can tell me or the track of the conversation can tell me. And so psychologically, you're going to repair that. You're going to give repeats of other information. So even though you don't know these other 4,000, you can engage in the conversation with 5,000. So, these words are required for true mastery. Okay? Uh, you don't just need them to read a novel. You get them from reading novels. You get these from the 9,000 level. And really, you can only efficiently get them from reading novels. You can get them from other ways. If you take a novel, if we say the average novel has 300 pages, okay, maybe 90,000, 100,000 words in it, okay? I'm going to talk a lot about audiobooks in a little while. To listen to the average novel takes about 10 hours, 10 hours of nonstop verbal input. So you could get the same effect of reading a novel like this uh, in conversation with one partner 
over time, okay? But in conversation, there has to be pauses, and you have to talk too. So rather than 10 hours of nonstop input, uh, you would need something like 30 or maybe 40 hours of conversation with one person in order to get their higher level of vocabulary into you by context. How many of you have 40-hour conversations with people? Okay, so <coughs> you can get this in other ways. I'm a university professor. A university class has 45 hours in it, so if you take a class with me in one semester and listen to my idiosyncratic vocabulary, you would pick up a lot of context, but you can read or listen to a book much faster. So efficiency requires reading novels. So, conclusion about that, about reading as a tool. Even if your goal is, uh, if you don't read, what's gonna happen? Like with my students, both in Singapore and in Dubai, you stagnate at that basic conversational level. The average person, the average learner. We're polyglots, we're not average, maybe it'll be different, higher for us, but, okay, you're going to stagnate at that basic level. So, since reading, leads to faster overall progress, even if your goal is just functional communication, you're gonna to get to that goal a lot faster if you use the tool of reading than if you don't, okay? So that is my conclusion for the first third of my talk, so I'll move on to the second part. Okay, you know how to read. You know, you're convinced now that you know how to read. Even if you're a polyglot who doesn't like reading, and there are some of us who will go unnamed, okay? We're convinced now <laughs> that we should be doing reading, okay? So how do you get some techniques? How do you start reading? Not just in one, but in many foreign languages. Given that we're already, okay, we followed Alex Rowling, we know how to speak multiple languages. Now how do we read multiple languages? Keep this in mind all the time. <laughs> that the visual interpretation of written symbols, this is a transferable skill. You only have to learn that one time. It's like learning how to ride a bicycle, okay? Then you know how to ride different kinds of vehicles. So if you only need to learn how to do this one time, you better learn how to do it very well. So a good thing to do before you go around trying to read in foreign languages is make sure that you can really read well in your own language. And unfortunately, in our day and age, when people don't read very much anymore, this is not a given, okay? If you do a speed test in your own language, you'll find there are certain levels that you're supposed to read at. So you might want to do something like improve your reading speed, your reading comprehension, and a very good test, but a mortifying test, for many native and near-native speakers is to read aloud. Reading aloud, okay, I'll go on and have another slide about that. Reading aloud is, I would say, the first technique that I would recommend. I would classify reading aloud as a reality check against this transferable skill. I ask my students in class to read texts aloud. And I have many, many native speakers in my classes, particularly in Dubai. They can't do it very well. They stumble. They have a hard time with three and four syllable words. It's obvious when they're reading aloud in conversation, they're 100% native. They grew up in an English language school. They might have grown up in the States or in England. But when, okay, they are trying to read a sentence aloud, they have no feeling for the flow of the argument. They have no tone. So what they're doing, they're externalizing this. This is what's going on in their head when they're reading to themselves. They're stumbling, they're tripping over the flow of the argument inside their heads, but they probably don't even know it. So reading aloud is embarrassing, it's mortifying, it's frustrating. It feels like it's slow, it feels like it's slowing you down. But it's worth doing. It's very much worth doing because if you keep at it, and you improve at it, and you get to the point when you can read well aloud, then when you be quiet and you read silently to yourself in your head, you're definitely going to read much better, much faster, with better comprehension. But, talking about techniques, I know, again, that since you're all such young people, what you really want to say, okay, you convinced me that I need to read more, show me some apps, show me some, uh, some computer programs that will help me read. Uh, they're out there, there are lots of them. Some of them are pretty good, but I'm too old to use them, okay? I'm too old to use them because I did most of my language learning before they developed to be pretty good, and because I sort of got this, uh, 
funny idea in my head that when I read, I need to focus. And that the computer is designed to be a multitasking tool. It's designed to distract me. So I don't like to read on the computer. Even if there's some good programs, I like to get away from it. But I will show you one program because I, I'll be happily surprised if anybody here knows it. But I don't think anybody will because it's not really designed as a reading program. But in my mind, it's far and away the best and most exciting way for reading. It's this one, keyboard.com. Does anybody know this? It's really a typing program. What is this? Can somebody identify this text? This is the beginning of crime and punishment, okay, by Dostoevsky. This is a program where you take a literary text. You can take any text, but I'm pushing you to read literature. You take a text, you put the text in, and then you type the text. So, this is great for kinesthetic learning, okay? If you say, I have a hard time concentrating, you want to learn something practical like typing, you can't go on if you make a mistake. If you make a mistake, it stops you and you have to correct the mistake before you go on. So you have to read extremely, extremely closely to use this program. You can do it in Russian, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, French, German, not too many other languages, but other languages. But yes, you input your own text as a literary text, and then you type it, and as you type it, you're reading it very, very closely. So I highly recommend this among computer programs, but other than that, get away from the computer, because the computer is going to go, ding, you have an email, ding, okay, there's an update on Facebook. We don't want that. We want to focus on reading. Okay. Choosing texts for extensive reading. Again, they have to be easy. So where can we look? You can always start out with children's books, illustrated children's books. It's sometimes embarrassing when you're an adult and you go back to the children's section, but we are children again, starting out in other languages. But sometimes children's books aren't all that easy. They're supposing a lot of knowledge, cultural knowledge you might not have yet. So the easiest thing to do, some people think it's such a burden, but it's not. You gotta count those words. Remember the formula, one word out of 50. It's 10, 10 words on a line, count five lines. See how many words there are that you don't know. If there are five words you don't know, that's too many. Find an easier book. If you know them all, that's too easy. Look for a harder book, okay? You should have on your average page about five or six words that you don't know. If that's the amount that you don't know, just read that book. You will learn those words by reading the book. You don't need to use a dictionary. Okay, there's something, and again, on Paul Nation's site, you can get them. Graded readers. What's a graded reader? Can somebody tell me? Yes. The books that are used at school for A1 or A2 vocabulary. Yeah, these are books that have been, often they take a novel and they rewrite it at a simple level and they say, okay, we'll write this so that if you know 4,000 words or 5,000 words or 6,000 words, this is appropriate for you. So there are graded readers out there, tons of them for English. They do exist for other languages, okay? As a re opposed to a regular reader or a primer, okay? These just have introductions. Sometimes these have vocabulary that's given to you. And so I say, these are kind of a crossover from intensive reading. You don't need to look up the words. The words are given to you. Uh, but these are other things that you can choose. But I think that the best way to go about developing reading ability in foreign languages is to use bilingual texts. Bilingual texts, when you get an anthology for them, these are usually short stories, and the whole idea is that they're supposed to be compared, the original to the translation, so they're on facing pages, and the translation is a very good, faithful, almost literal translation. That's what you want to look for, not a better literary translation, but a faithful translation. And you can use these in different stages. If you've just learned the language, you're not really reading yet, but the first thing you can do is literally just compare sentence by sentence, okay? And get some more practice by that. But once you start reading, you can do it in stages. You can read first the translation and then the original, back to back. You start out, I got a big stack of books like this. The first one you read, you might do paragraph by paragraph. Paragraph of translation, paragraph of original. Paragraph of translation, paragraph of original. You go on to doing a page at a time, maybe a chapter at a time, okay? 
Then, once you've read, I don't know, depends on how hard the language is for you, a stack of these, five, ten of these books, what you can do after that is you can forget about reading the translation first, just read the original. Read the original, and when you don't understand it, when you can't follow it, instead of looking at a dictionary, looking up words that you're not sure if you're choosing the right word, you read the translation then, and you're given uh, the meaning in that fashion. So again, bilingual texts are usually of, say, short story anthologies. Once you've progressed to this stage of developing ability to read in a foreign language that you've studied however, uh, as a polyglot would, you're ready to go on to the next stage, which is reading novels. And novels, it's very helpful to read in translation. So you get two different volumes, okay? You get the original and you get the translation. But the difference between this and a bilingual text is that the bilingual texts are prepared with that comparison in mind. Whereas the novel has usually been translated with the idea of giving a good faithful representation in the new language. And so uh, it's not as faithful a match. They don't go as well together. But that's okay because you're much more advanced by this stage. So you can use translations of novels the same way you'd use a bilingual text by reading the translation first and again, continuing to progress. By the time you get to this, you should be able to read a whole chapter at a time, and then maybe you'll be able to read a book at a time. But there's another aspect that you add at this stage, or that I've always added, is that it's not just stage-wise in terms of quantity of text that you read, but also the amount of time that you let go by between reading. So the first time you do this, you want to read the translation, and as soon as you put it down, go back and pick up the original text and read it right away. So the whole story is completely fresh in your mind. But after you do this a couple of times, you specifically don't want to do that anymore. You want to let more time go by. You want to let a week go by. You want to let a month go by so that you know the story, and it's not that you're just dredging up fresh impressions from your memory, but you're really understanding on a deeper and deeper level. So it's important to let more and more time go by, and eventually a time will come when you'll say, I want to read this book, no translations available, the hell with it, I'm just going to read it, and then you'll really be reading in a foreign language. So, the final thing, the final real technique, or thing that you can use uh, to learn to read foreign languages, is audiobooks. And again, uh, because I'm old, I need to give a little bit of history here. That audiobooks, in case you young people don't know it, they haven't really been around that long, okay? And so audiobooks have some people who have real arguments against them. There are people who are opposed to audiobooks, who think audiobooks are bad. And I have to confess that I used to be one of those people. I used to be anti-audiobook, okay? I used to think, because when I was your age, audiobooks existed, but they were books for the blind. They were books for handicapped people. They were books for illiterate people. And so I don't know where I got this prejudice, but I inherited this prejudice and stigma against them. They're not something that you would pick up and read if you know how to read. They're for handicapped people. I thought that using an audiobook was an easy, lazy way of reading. If you told me 20 years ago, oh, I'm listening to Crime and Punishment, I might have sort of sneered at you inside and said, huh, you don't know how to read? Okay. Uh, I thought somehow that it didn't count. That if you're going to read a book, you need to engage the text. You need to process the thought process of the author. I thought, if I, that's not good enough. I, I need to articulate something more. What's wrong with audiobooks, I would say? Well, you're supposed to interpret the book. But when you listen to an audiobook, you have the narrator doing it. And so that's somehow invalid. And there are still people out there who think this way. As I confess, I'm ashamed to say, I used to think this way. But since then, uh, well, from this perspective, I've committed treason. I've gone over to the other side. I've converted. Okay? Here are all the arguments in answer and in turn to that to answer why audiobooks are good things. Okay? Audiobooks are not just for blind people or handicapped people. All literature comes from oral traditions. Anything you wanted to listen to for the past 5,000 years was related by a bard or a narrator or a ter talented uh, storyteller. Okay? Um, still, authors read sections of their text. We know, sociologically speaking, into the 19th century when people like Charles Dickens published their novels in serial form that families would sit around and read chapters to each other. So it's nonsense to think that audiobooks are just for blind, handicapped people. It's also 
my own experience and a lot of research suggests it's wrong to think that they're easy and lazy. It's actually harder to listen to a book than it is to read it. People have done studies on this. We'll give this half of the room the text of Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment to read. We'll let you listen to it. Then we'll give you a comprehension test afterwards. Who's going to do better? They are. Because when you're listening to an audiobook, it's easier to get distracted. And once you are distracted, okay, it's much harder to go back and find out what you lost. So it's nonsense to say that this is the easy, lazy way to do it. It's actually a harder way to process texts. What matters when you hear a story is that you know the story. If you understand the argument, you know what happens. If you like the words and you can quote them, you know the story. You read it. It doesn't matter if you did it with your eyes or with your ears. So there goes that argument that it somehow doesn't count. The only cogent argument that remains somehow is that about narrator. And that, that is a fact. With narrator, okay, when it's just you in the text, it's just you in the text. When there's a narrator, there's you, the narrator, and the text. He is interpreting, or she is interpreting, to a certain degree. You can override that. It doesn't completely determine your understanding of the story, okay? but it is a factor. More than that, I would say audiobooks, they totally revolutionize reading in this factor of introducing the narrator because that narrator is so very, very, very important. A good narrator, a talented narrator, can make you appreciate, like, enjoy a book that you would have hated otherwise, you wouldn't have liked. Conversely, unfortunately, a bad narrator will ruin a book that you love. And this is one way, one reason it's good to be old, because we have incomes and we can buy audiobooks. There are a lot of audiobooks out there that are free in this world, and there are free audio narrators who are better than professional ones, there are bad professional ones, but in general, you get what you pay for. Okay? And professional audiobooks with professional narrators, actors, they do cost some money, but it's worth the investment, I think, if you can afford it, to get something that's really been narrated well. So they gave me something to drink, let me drink it. How exactly do you use audiobooks? I use audiobooks, or I've used audiobooks in five different ways to help me learn to read foreign languages. The first way <coughs> is you have a translated text and you listen to the original audio. This is very good for holistic learning. For those of us who learn by Asimil, this is very similar to doing that. Okay? This is a way that you can develop overall language knowledge. There are some people out there in the language learning community who have no patience for textbooks. And they would say that using this is a way that you can totally avoid textbooks if you can really just learn from the original. They call this listening reading. Okay? But the problem with this kind, uh, and I think that what this is basically doing, so many people mention that one way that people who learn languages really well outside of the context is by watching television or watching movies with subtitles. That's basically what this is, one long running subtitle. You have the entire thing in front of you with subtitles. You're listening and you see the entire thing and you're getting much, much more input than you're getting from a movie or a television show or anything. The problem is, as I put here, it's difficult to anchor yourself. You're listening to a language that you don't understand that well and you're reading a story that's supposed to be interesting and engaging for you in a language that you understand much better. You can get into the story and just read ahead and then you're not tied together anymore and then you're not getting any real benefit from doing this. So, because my topic is reading, actually, the reverse of this is a much better way for developing vocabulary and reading knowledge. So the reverse of this is when you read the original text. You look at the original text, but you listen to a translation. You can't get ahead of yourself there, okay, because you're going, your eyes are staying on the slower text and it's anchored to it much better. And although you're not developing pronunciation or other aspects. We're not after this holistic aspect right now. We're after reading knowledge. So this is a better way for developing your ability to read and widen your vocabulary. A third way, once you've gone beyond that, is you use both the original text and the original translation, I'm sorry, the original audio. Okay, so you would listen, if I'm staying with the Prime and Punishment, I'd read it in Russian and I'd listen in Russian. And this, if we're having trouble reading aloud, as we all do when we try to read a new foreign language aloud, this is a really great way of developing that ability in particular. Then, 
The whole benefit of audiobooks is that you don't want to completely uh, substitute reading text, but you can supplement it. You can get away. You just use the audio. When you can follow the story, okay, you can just listen to the story. You can shadow it if you want to. You can go for a run and listen to a story at the same time. You can combine it with a lot of exercises. And the fifth and final way is, to me, uh, I was really intrigued, Yosef, yesterday when you mentioned that there's a way of looking at two different subtitles at once. And I thought, Alex, you might have said a bit more today about trying to maintain and juggle. I mean, those of us who have lots of languages that we try to balance is just not enough time in the day. There's a way that you can use audiobooks, not so much to develop reading knowledge, but to gain maybe an extra hour or something in the day. Okay? If you read the text in one language and you listen to it in another language at the same time, particularly if you've studied comparative historical linguistics or if you like comparative philology and say you do this, you read the text in Spanish and you're good enough for both languages and you listen in Italian, you're comparing the structure of the language. It's a fascinating thing to do. And you are truly, when you try to combine other studies, if you just use a, a French-based assimil to study Serbian, you study for a whole hour, but you've only spent maybe 15 minutes with French and 45 minutes with Serbian. If you're trying to say, did I get enough study of both languages? It's, it's cheating to give yourself an hour for each. But with this, you have literally spent an hour with each language. So this is a way to uh, make the day last 25 hours rather than just 24. So uh, having said that about techniques, now I'd like to move on to the third part about target. Having as a target specifically the reading of literature, so I need to go back and visit my definition of literature. I'm going to be more demanding now. Definition of literature two. It's not just any lengthy text, it's a more traditional definition of literature as, well, let's start with high quality fiction. Most people would agree with that. We have cheap trashy novels and we have well-written art novels, okay? Well-written, okay? They should be, more specifically, culturally significant. They should be, okay, consciously and artistically crafted. They should have a message to convey, not just entertainment, edification, make you better, tell you something, make you think about something about the world. This is literature because, again, as Alex was saying a little bit earlier, in order to really master a language, you don't just need vocabulary. You don't just need grammar. You don't just need pragmatics. You need in-depth knowledge of cultural context. You need to know the traditions. You need to know the background of how people think, where they come from. And exactly this, precisely this, is what we find encapsulated in literature with the second definition. So I think, okay, let's talk about polyglottery. Everybody here is supposed to be here because we either are polyglots or we're interested in it, okay? Polyglottery is, we start it. Uh, where's Bartolomeu? I haven't seen him today, but I liked what he said yesterday. Uh, we don't necessarily choose to study languages, maybe they choose us, isn't that what you said, okay? So polyglottery gets its start because for whatever reason, we're wired to like learning languages. But what happens once we become polyglots and we know lots of languages? Then our minds are expanded, okay? And we can go through space compared to people, okay? Uh, who stay locked in their own culture, and their own place, you can go to other cultures. You can go to other places and understand uh, how, how people think. Your, Hawaiian, your horizons are widened, and you can go, you don't have to stay where you were born. You can go somewhere else. So if this is a benefit that polyglottery brings to you, what about, should I go back? What about polyliteracy? Polyliteracy. Polyliteracy, to me, this is one more logical step. Polyliteracy, okay, adds to that ability to travel through space, the ability to travel through time. You can add a diachronic cross-time perspective, okay, and you can go into the same cultural mindsets of people in the past. Great authors have been writing for 5,000 years. As long as we stay in the conversational level, we don't end to hear about them very much. Once you go into the literary level, you can converse with somebody, you can interact with the mindset of somebody who wrote something 500 or 1,000 years ago, okay? And so this is how I define polyliteracy. It's a quest to understand and appreciate culturally significant texts from multiple places and times as they were originally written. 
I think that's a very worthy thing to do with your mind. That's a good scholarly lifetime is to spend your as you're chasing after this kind of thing. And I've never met anybody said, no, that's invalid as such, somebody who values a scholarly life to begin with. But just as we have all encountered sort of doubtful feelings in ourselves and from those around us saying, can you really learn to speak all these different languages? Since learning to read together with speaking is harder than learning how to just converse, people think, is it even possible to learn to read lots of languages? It is possible. It's a lifetime task. It takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of perseverance, okay? Systematic planning and application, it takes a lot longer than just to become conversationally a polyglot, but you can become a polyliterate person by following the same steps. So I'd like to move on to one final aspect. Obviously, if you're going to read multiple languages, let's assume that you've developed that ability by using these techniques. Now, okay, you need to do a special kind of balancing act to find time for all of them. So I've tried over the years different kinds of balancing acts. The first thing I did is I said, I'm going to give myself 15 minutes a day to read each of the languages that I know how to read. That's the same thing that I did when I was learning languages, the same thing I did when I was studying languages. So I thought, well, I'll just keep that now, reading texts rather than reading textbooks. This gives you linguistic balance. You can get coverage of all your languages, but it doesn't give you any degree of satisfaction. It doesn't give you any intellectual stimulus for the story that you're following. Um, it doesn't give you any balance in terms of the literature that you're reading. So I didn't do that very long. So I thought, if I, this doesn't work, I need to do something else. I tried saying, let me read one book in each language, in each language family in turn. So for example, in the Germanic language family, I would read one book in modern German, and then I'd go and I'd read a book in uh, medieval German. And then maybe I'd read a book in Swedish, and then I'd read a book in Old Norse, then I'd read a book in Dutch, and so on. The problem with that is you get very frustrated. There's no continuity of interest. When you're reading a book by Hermann Hesse, and you finish that, you want to read something else that he wrote. You don't want to say, okay, I have to put this aside. I'm not going to read another book in German until I've gone through all these others. I'm going to read this. That's very frustrating. And also, since the whole purpose is to build balance, this actually causes lack of equilibrium. Because I don't read Swedish or Dutch as fast as I read German. So I'm trying to balance my languages out by reading a book in each, and I end up spending a lot more time reading my minor languages than my major languages. Let me explain that. No language is objectively minor, but I think we all have our stronger languages, the one we learn first, the ones we know better, the ones we use more. I call those major languages, and the ones that we don't have as strong, maybe we want to, but we don't have them as strong yet, I call them minor languages. So I didn't do this that long. What I tried to do after that was experiment. Okay, rather than a book at a time, let me say, okay, I'll read a week at a time, or maybe a month at a time in each language. Same thing. If I say I only read for one week, then I have to stop reading. I'm in the middle of a book. That's not very satisfying. Okay? And I also feel like, gosh, I just read this, and now I have to wait six months or nine months or a whole year before I can read it again. That's not very frustrating. That's not very satisfying. So what I've ultimately ended up doing is developing this kind of complicated system of interlocking major and minor cycles. I read the major languages uh, in longer time frames, more frequent time frames, and I read the uh, minor languages in uh, shorter time frames. So for an example, with the Romance language family, my major languages are French and Spanish, and I wish the others weren't minor, but they are. So what I do is I read maybe one month in modern contemporary French, and then I'll read one week of medieval French. Then I'll read Spanish for a month. Then maybe I'll read a week in Latin. Then another month in modern French. Then maybe a week in Italian. Another month in Spanish. Week in Portuguese. So on, so forth. Okay? 
And there was a time when I was obsessive compulsive about this and tracked this and put it on a time frame. And I'm happy to say that life caught up with me. My sons got a little bit bigger. My job got a bit more demanding. I have to you know, just be a bit more flexible. And so I'm not as uh, obsessive about this as I used to be. I've just internalized this rhythm. And I go with my uh, interest a bit more. I don't necessarily say, OK, my 30 days are up. I'm going to stop this book. I finish it, and I read a little bit more if I like. But I basically follow a system like this. And what have I found about this? It's fascinating to me. I would like to be a guinea pig in somebody else's research and find out how this works, because I don't quite understand it myself. I'm just telling you what I found, is that major progress leads to minor progress. What do I mean by that? is that I make more overall progress with my minor languages this way than I did when I tried to give them more time. So I said, unfortunately for me, Italian is not a major language. So I remember trying to read a novel by Umberto Eco a number of years ago, and I had to sweat to do it. And then I got into this other system, and when I went back, after having not read any Italian anymore, and I read another novel by him, it was not such a sweat. It was not so demanding. I'd made more progress by developing this strategy within a language family. Okay? To read better across the board in all the languages in a family, it seems to be better to develop a few to a very high level, and then you'll have more to translate. And that was sort of the essence of one of the questions I asked the young polyglots yesterday, is that you can't know this until you start to get old and get experience. You can pass a C2 level test in a language at some point when you're young. And then if you keep working at it in 10 years, I mean, how can you go beyond C2? But you do. You know it much deeper. You know it much better. You know it at a much more profound level. And so that's what's going on here. You need to spend more time getting these few languages to a very, very high level. And then the languages that are related to them, you'll have a lot more to transfer. And it's easy to balance this way. I have to bracket this. Definitely, it doesn't work for everything. Nuances, slang, colloquial language, okay? How to understand false friends. This doesn't go away just by developing the majors. This is stuff you have to work at on an individual level. But as a basic strategy for balancing and being able to be polyliterate and read in lots of languages, this is a good strategy. How much time have I taken? Exactly an hour, okay? Um, do I have any questions or comments at this point? Does anybody like to ask something? We'll take a few questions now, and then you can talk to Professor Arguelles during the lunchtime. I think uh, that's where we'll do it. Okay? Um, I'll go back to the well, you have mentioned audio books. Uh, uh, there are languages where I think the audio uh, listening to the text is very important because I found out that there are words. Uh, if you read them in the novels, you might not recognize them in a conversation because, for instance, in languages like English. Uh, the pronunciation may by, might be different. For instance, I might have read in a novel gauge or, to, or uh, tomb or uh, chores, but if I don't know how to pronounce them, I just uh, won't recognize them in a conversation. For, for me, I wouldn't, go, I, I wouldn't go near an English novel without having also the audio books because uh, it's just too easy uh, uh, to learn a uh, false pronunciation. Uh, that's my experience. I don't know if you have been dealing with this problem as well. That's kind of when I made the list of three different ways to use audiobooks. Maybe I didn't highlight that, but that third way, when you read and look at the original text, to learn to read aloud, that's what I meant. That particularly for languages such as uh, English and French that aren't phonetic, um, that's a necessary tool. And it's sort of hard to imagine how uh, people uh, back 20, 30 years ago, before audiobooks were mainstream and acceptable and accepted, uh, how they managed to do that. So uh, that's one reason I'm glad that I'm around now. Yes. Can you comment on anything that you've done to sort of build up your tolerance for uh, not knowing what's going on in a text? You, ta you talked about uh, the certain percentages, and I've, I've sort of, I'm going to re reevaluate my own percentage. I've, I've gone with 90%, and I have to have a certain tolerance of not knowing what's going on. I'm wondering if you can provide some personal context. 
as I said, I mean, I have just gone through that my own stage. There was a time when I thought I don't need that 98% level. I could do it with 95, and I would just say, or, I mean, I wasn't being exactly with those numbers, but I had that same experience. There were some languages I was listening to, and I would start, you know, to to read and, and or listen to this book, and you know, the first couple of chapters were fine, but you know, by the time I got to the middle of the book, I was always bored with it, and this happened again and again and again with authors that I thought I should really like this, and I realized that's what was going on. I wasn't reading at a high enough level to do that. And so yes, just going back and doing some of the things that I said, reading something in translation first, and then reading the original, building up your vocabulary to a higher level, uh, biting the bullet and reading something that's a bit simpler or not necessarily what you want to read. I mean, if you're starting out to, if your goal is to read Dostoevsky, that's why you're learning Russian, uh, then it's not fun to read Harry Potter translated into Russian, but if that's a step along the way, you know, that's, that's a way that you can build up your vocabulary, yes. Good morning. Um, my question isn't directly related to the talk, but more about a connection between the beginning of it and the remainder of it. Uh, it's, from my conversations with people here over the course of the weekend, it seems like a lot of us start out with, say, a teach yourself or a colloquial course or an assimil course. We say, oh, I'm interested in this language, and we find a beginner's textbook or something. And these courses generally seem to give you in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 words, and yet we need 9,000 minimum to read a novel. So how do we bridge that chasm between the 2,000 words we know when we finished our colloquial or assimil and the 9,000 that we need to even begin to engage in the extensive reading? Okay. Um, yeah, I too, uh, you know, back in my learning stage, I used mainly assimil type books and just what I did, I mean, I wouldn't just use one. There are several generations of them. I would use two or three of them, and then once I finished them, I'd go back and I'd do some more traditional uh, grammatical type studies. So I didn't limit my textbook learning. I didn't, I wasn't impatient to get away from it. I like textbooks. I like dictionaries. I like studying, and so I stayed with that for a while. And then just exactly what I said, going through the stage of bilingual texts, okay, in the stages that I had them, and it works differently with, again, my strongest languages are in the Germanic and Romance families, which are all related to each other and related to me, but with languages that are more exotic and more difficult, it takes more time, and you kind of need to activate them. I don't think I, I could have gotten to that with Russian if I hadn't gone and done an immersion homestay in, in a Russian environment. I did relocate to Korea and live there for 10 years so that I could develop my Korean ability. I've been in Arabic-speaking countries for five years now so that I'm doing this with my Arabic. You have to make sacrifices and work at it. It takes a lot longer, okay? Um, it's not an easy bridge, but I would say, yes, by a bit more continued study and then working through bilingual texts the way I describe here, um, that's how I did it. Uh, do you find that uh, all these reading practice that you do, uh, reading aloud, also listening to audiobooks, uh, do you find that this is transferable to a conversation setting, or does that take a different skill um, altogether? Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Um, I, I'm asking if all these reading practice that you do, including reading aloud and listening to audiobooks, is easily transferable to a conversation setting, or does that take a different, a completely different skill to develop? I suppose in general, conversation comes before reading, okay, in a sort of normal developmental scale, but if you don't have the opportunity to converse and you develop your reading ability uh, first, then uh, you may run the risk of uh, talking like a book, but you'll sound like a sophisticated book, and that's not something that's ever bothered me, so I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Um, you mentioned the, the idea that when you are less advanced, you might want to read the, the, the original immediately after the translation, and you mentioned that as you get more advanced, you might want to have a bit of space so that it's not so fresh and you are really understanding it. Um, for me, like for example, there's a book I love to do is The Little Prince, where I, I find it's a really nice introduction to reading where I have a high comprehension, like 98%-ish. Would you say that reading the same book over and over again to, for multiple languages, so using that book to go to French, then to Spanish, then to Japanese, is there a point where you get a peak in terms of you're no longer really gaining as much from it or maybe even actually diminishing the value of the exercise because then you know the story so well. You get sick of it. Yeah. Or that you maybe you're not using this space repetition type thing. Yeah. You no, I, I've, I've faced that. You just get sick of it. You just, you know, uh, it's, it's just... It, 
you, the, it's not a question, you do know it well, you know what's going on, but the story is no longer interesting, the story is no longer engaging, and even though you're challenging yourself by using new vocabulary and forms and structures, you're, you just can't be as focused and as attentive to it because, you know, it's the same story you just read 548 times, and the 549th time is just, there's nothing more to add to it. So, um, yeah, I've been there, I've done that, I know that, and yeah, it's, it's not, to me, it's not a good strategy to use the same book over and over and over again in different languages. So um, certain things, it would be nice if there were more translations of certain easy books, but there are certain that are like The Little Prince and Harry Potter that are sort of widely out there, and I know a lot of people try to use the same ones for different languages, but it, just, it gets tedious and you start to feel like this isn't why I'm learning the language, I'm learning it for Dostoevsky, I'm not learning it for, for, for this. Yeah. I'm interested by the emphasis you place on reading aloud in a foreign language, despite the fact that arguably reading aloud in a foreign language is probably one of the least useful skills you can develop as a language learner, is it's, it's not very applicable. There's very few instances where you actually need to do it. Um, I was wondering if you know of any other exercises students can do to develop reading skills in a way that pay attention to the flair and the rhythm of a language without having to develop a skill which maybe is, is not so useful. Uh, again, uh, on my list of f five different ways to use the audiobooks, the third one where you're listening to and going along with it, if you think of it not just as reading aloud but as shadowing it so that you're getting the intonation and you're getting the speaking at the same means that you're getting that, you're basically doing the same thing but you're focusing more on accurate listening and accurate pronunciation. So you could say those are better transferable skills. I hear what you're saying. Reading aloud uh, is it's not something you do outside of it. But as an exercise, um, yes, I mean, it's, it's really invaluable. I mean, I'm working with Arabic right now. Uh, and I'm at a stage when, give me a, an Arabic text, if I read it silently in my head, I'll look at it and I'll think, I, I know how to read this page, I can read it, but if I try to read it aloud, I stumble, okay? And I forget where does this sentence end and where does this sentence begin? And only by doing that am I getting any better at that. So uh, it might not be leading to some uh, other skill, okay? You might never become an uh, audiobook narrator in Arabic by doing that, but um, it's, it has such great benefits for your ability to speak and learn that I, to me it's a very worthwhile exercise. I've been signaled that we should stop answering questions now because lunch is getting ready outside and yesterday it was such a long, long line in the hot sun to get our food, so we need more time for that. But if anybody would like to keep uh, discussing any of these matters with me, uh, we have more time over lunch and at the rest of the conference. I'm very happy to talk about this with anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. So if you have you want to start